Okay, good evening, everyone from India, wherever you're joining. Let us uh, join hands in welcoming uh, Dr. Linwei Shin. Uh, Dr. Linwei is Assistant Professor of Operations Management at the Booth School of Business, University of Chicago. Uh, his primary research is on inventory and supply chain management uh, in a variety of domains, including designing models and algorithms for organizations to effectively match supply with demand, which is the core problem in operations. Uh, his work is widely recognized by several awards, including the uh, George Nicholson Student Prize Paper Competition, uh, JFIG, and also a finalist in the MSOM Paper Competition. Uh, most importantly for his contribution to practice, his work with JD.com is uh, also recognized as a fan finalist in the Edelman Award last year. And nevertheless, uh, the Edelman Prizes are very uh, recognizable across the world. And it's, I think we are very proud to host him today. Uh, his publications are also appeared in top uh, journals, including OR, Management Science, uh, Math of OR, uh, Interfaces. So without much uh, delay, I would welcome uh, Dr. Lin Wei Sheen for the presentation on designing sparse graphs for stochastic matching with an application to middle mine transportation management. It is a core problem in e-commerce. We have the first mile, middle mile, and the last mile. And middle mile is often kind of ignored. So I think that's a, that's a great problem to look into. So without much delay, let's uh, welcome uh, Dr. Linway. And uh, again, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A tab and we will take them as we go, right? Welcome, uh, Linway, and the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, Devji. It's a really honor to be here. Um, and thanks so much for the very nice introduction. Uh, just as you mentioned, a middle mile is a very important area, but, but, but has been less studied. Uh, so this is the, uh, the purpose for today's presentation. Um, this work is, uh, was partially supported by Alibaba China. Um, my co collaborators um, on this work include uh, Yifan Fong, who is an assistant professor at NUS. Uh, and so I want to acknowledge that um, Yifan did most of the work. So he graduated from Chicago um, two years ago and mo most of the work was done by him. And my other collaborators include two of my colleagues, uh, Rene Kildenti and Yuan Zhong, and two managers from, from Alibaba, Ding and Hao Yuan, who have been very generously supporting our research. Um, so let me start with the high level introduction. Um, e commerce, uh, the boom of e commerce has been witnessed in recent years. Uh, before the pandemic uh, in 2019, the US online sales accounting for 11% of all retail sales. And this ratio was higher globally, reaching 14%. And the ratio was projected to reach 22% in 2024. Those data were before the pandemic. Now, given what has happened in the past two years, now you can imagine the trend will continue. Um, so a, a major problem for, for many retainers is how to manage costs, uh, specifically logistic costs. When we talk about logistic costs, there are typically two major portions, uh, shipping and fulfillment. Um, fulfillment costs are those costs incurred within a warehouse or fulfillment center. So think about the, the cost to help a staff to do the picking, packing, so on and so forth. The other major portion is the outbound shipping. So the cost to transporting packages from warehouse to customers. And in today's presentation, we will focus on mid-mount transportation. We will only focus on shipping cost. Okay, now let me illustrate what I mean by middle-mount transportation. Um, so here, let me use Amazon's uh, logistic process as, as the illustration example. Just, uh, just imagine one customer placing an order and then the order is routing to a fulfillment center for picking and packing. Now, uh, when the package uh, uh, departs from the warehouse, there are usually two possibilities. One is that uh, Amazon simply hire a third party logistics company, uh, uh, such as UPS, FedEx, to handle shipping. So, so that be done by, by third party uh, uh, logistics companies. Uh, the other possibility is that uh, Amazon also has uh, their own uh, logistic network. So means they have their own uh, transportation teams to take care of this package. The package will uh, go through several sortation centers and eventually reach uh, last mail station and then deliver to the customers. 
so many companies are using such a hybrid model, right? So uh, they have own logistic work. They also have three PLs. And middle mile happens between uh, when the package depart from the warehouse until the package reach last mile stations. Um, so, so you may uh, be familiar with last miles. So last miles means uh, the transportation from last mile stations to customers. So uh, what are delivery stations, right? Think about their, your local post office. Um, so th th they are typically close to customers, right? And then we just serve as a sortation center. And middle mile means the transportation from warehouse to delivery stations. And typically a uh, middle mile is handled by, by trainer trucks. So those are the tr uh, trucks, you know, do the routine transportation. And the last miles typically are handled by smaller vans, so on and so forth. So today we will focus on middle mile transportation. So we are thinking about the process when the package departs from a warehouse and then reach a last mile station. Okay, now a, a middle mile transportation problem is the following. Uh, suppose we focus on a region. Here you can think about region as a city. And the region is divided into different rooms, right? Um, and, and each room has a last mile station uh, set, right? Uh, just as I mentioned, you can think about those are your post offices. And there's a single warehouse that uh, serves th th this region. Um, so um, a typical region, say a typical city has one warehouse and uh, just about a hundred last mile delivery stations. And that every day, the demand uh, uh, realize at each station. And then you send a truck to, to transport package from this warehouse to each site. Now, the current practice is mostly direct shipping. Direct shipping means you send one truck to one site. Right, just imagine if you have seven, a uh, uh, hundred stations that you would lead a um, hundred trucks every day. Right, so there's uh, mostly direct shipping. And why uh, do company do direct shipping? So um, a, a simple answer is that be easy to manage. Right, so you just use one truck for one side. So that's really easy to manage. And also the truck drivers know knows their routine routes, right? They just go to you know, this um, station every day. So they know the route very well. Then what are the uh, downsides? So downside, obviously uh, this um, system is less efficient. So for example, if there are two sites that are close to each other and on a particular day, the demand realizes are both low, means you can actually use one truck to fulfill both sites. So instead of setting two trucks to each site, you can simply use one truck to fulfill both demand. So, so this we call indirect shipping, means we are now a truck to serve multiple sites in a, an, on a single route. And this will reduce uh, the, the cost for transportation. Okay, now the question is uh, the balance between uh, flexibility and efficiency. So uh, flexibility means um, how flexible is this transportation network? So in a fully, uh, so in the direct shipping only setting, so simply there's no flexibility. You can only, you, you can, uh, you cannot serve two sides by a single truck. And the benefits of flexibility is that you can better use of truck capacity. So, so you, say you have resource pooling and, and you can reduce transportation costs. But on the other side, you don't want too much flexibility. So for example, uh, clearly you don't want to link two sides that are further away, right? So, so um, for this graph, so for example, these two sides are further away, right? So you cannot uh, fulfill these two sides by a single truck for many realistic reasons. So for example, there are deadlines for the truck, right? So, so if the truck visits this side and do the uploading and then further travel to to the other side of the city for another site, they may be late for delivery. So there are many uh, realistic operational 
constraints that we have to consider. So that's why we don't want too much flexibility. Now the question is that how much flexibility do we use to significantly improve the efficiency? So, so uh, on one side, we do want to add a little flexibility, but the other side, we don't want too much flexibility. So the question is how much flexibility do we need here? Um, so uh, the benefit of limited flexibility was lower management costs, so they'll be easier to manage. And furthermore, the roles are more, predict are more predictable, means the drivers go to the single routes on a daily basis. So that would be, uh, be more easier for truck drivers. OK. Um, uh, before I go to the model, um, so any questions from the audience? So oh, there, are no, there are no uh, open questions at this moment. So you okay. can, uh, can continue. Right, thank you. All right. Um, so let me go to the model part. We consider a general graph. And this graph has a set of uh, vertexes. So think about those are your stations, uh, last mile stations. So there are N stations and the demands, we assume they are ID. Uh, and uh, uh, ID demand are obviously, um, you know, a, a, a condition to, to have us do the analysis. Um, so, so I will acknowledge that. And E means a set of edges, all right? So, so I think about how can you link to, you know, different sites together. Track capacity is C. Without loss of generality, we assume demand is always less than D, a C. Okay, so means, means uh, one try is always sufficient to fulfill one site. Now we talk about pooling. One a truck can fulfill two sites. So there are two conditions. One is that you know, these two sites are collected. So you, you, uh, if in this graph, for, um, we have an edge between two sites and they can potentially be pulled together. The other condition is that the realized demand should be less than truck capacity. So DI plus DZ should be less than C. Otherwise, if on a single day, both demand are high and we still need two trucks. Okay, so here's uh, two example. Say demand realized at six, three, and eight, and the truck capacity is 10. Okay, and then in, in this system, um, so we can use two trucks. So one truck to fulfill these two sites. Six plus three is less than 10, so we can use uh, one truck. The other truck only dedicated for set three. So for this example, on this day, we needed two trucks. Right? Compared with like in a setting, you only do direct shipping, you would need three trucks. Okay, uh, now the research uh, objective is to find a sparse graph, right? So we want to design a sparse graph G such that the, the, the performance of this graph is very close to the performance of a complete graph, Kn. So Kn means the complete graph means uh, any two edges have, uh, uh, so any two sides have an edge. So means we can put any two sides together. Um, here, uh, M of G means the expected number of trucks required on the graph G. Okay, so essentially we want to compile two graph designs. One is the complete graph, so we serve as a benchmark. The other is the design, uh, all design, G. Um, so the objective, the proposed measure is the expected number of trucks on the both designs. And so uh, MKN is always less than MG for any G. So this is because KN ha has the most flexibility. So, so which leads to the least number of trucks. So that's why MKN is always less than MG. Now the question is that, can we design a sparse graph? Sparse means G does not have too many edges. We want to design a sparse graph such that the, the performance of this graph is very close to that of the complete graph. Okay, um, so we made assumption on demand. Um, so we essentially didn't make binary demand. Demands either high or low, okay? So high demand DH or low demand DL with some probabilities. And we assume both demand 
cannot be beyond the capacity C. So means one track is always sufficient. We all assume only low demand sites can be served together. Okay. So for example, if uh, in, in this case, one site is high, the other side is no, then we cannot serve both sites together. So we have to use a dedicated truck for the site with high demand. We, we can only serve two sites with no demand together. All right, so in this example, say uh, this site is high demand, the other two are low demand, then we still need three trucks, right? So we still need one truck for here, one truck for here and one for here. So even though we have two edges in this graph, but for this particular demand realization, we still need three trucks. And say on a different day, uh, so these two sides have both low demand and then we can pull that together. Okay, now the question is that uh, once we design a sparse graph and then we see demand realization, how do we know the number of trucks required? So this actually reduced to a maximum matching problem for a random graph. Okay, so oh, yes. So one quick question, uh, Linway, is that do you also consider disruptions? For example, it's possible that uh, you know some road is uh, not really operational, uh, so the trucks can be also moving from another direction or another road. So do you also look at those randomness as well? Oh, okay, very good question. Uh, so in this study, we don't. We only consider uh, the, the disruption for nodes, not for edges. Okay, uh, okay. Right, but uh, so, so there's something, certainly we could, uh, you know, uh, uh, so that'd be interesting to, to look at, uh, but for this work, we don't. Okay. okay. All right, thank you. Uh, so here, uh, since David mentioned the word disruption, okay, so let me just use the same words. Uh, so disruption here, I mean for nodes. Um, say I have a high demand nodes, and then I know those high demand nodes can only be served by a single truck, right? And then I just simply delete those nodes in my graph because they cannot be pulled with other sides. Okay, so it's somehow it's, uh, we, we have some disruption for nodes. And then once we delete those sites with high demand and the subgraph remaining would be a one that only have no demand size. And then we can do, do pool together. So for example, in this example, um, so we know this site high demand and then we simply remove this site because it can only be served by one truck. So no pooling possibility. And then we look at the remaining subgraph and then we try to find the maximum matching for this graph. So which is one, means these two sides can be pulled together. So in summary, uh, to find the maximum, uh, to, to decide the number of trucks for the remaining graph, uh, the question is essentially to decide the number of maximum match. So let me be uh, uh, briefly explain what I mean by maximum match in a graph. I will start with matching. Matching is uh, a, a a set of edges in, in this graph that uh, collect two nodes together. And furthermore, those matching do not share a common node. In this graph, the red edge is a matching. In this graph, um, uh, we have two matchings. So one here, one's here. You know, they don't share a node. So it's here, we have two matching. Another question is that um, how to find the maximum matching. So clearly this one is not the, the, the best way you find maximum matching um, because you can do better. So, so if you choose these two sets together and these two nodes together, you can do better. So in, in this graph, the maximum matching uh, so actually has two edges. For this example, you can do three and here is two. Okay, so from this example, um, I hope uh, now to show you some ideas how to find the number of trucks required. So that's essentially to find the number of maximum matchings in the remaining graph. So just as I mentioned, once you delete those high demand nodes, the remaining graph would be the one only has low, uh, low demand. And then the, the problem will be reduced to find the maximum matching in, in this subgraph. Okay, so in summary, so essentially we deal with a two-stage optimization problem. In the first stage, we design a graph design. 
Okay, so, so you can think about the graph design is a, a technical de a, a tactical decision, right? So you somehow you design your graph and then you remain the same design for, for the rest of the quarter. And then on a daily operation level, there'll be the second stage problem, okay? Now on every day, you see the memory realization and then you find a maximum matching to decide the number of trucks. <clears throat> okay, uh, so let me illustrate. So here I have two graph designs. So one is here, the other is here. And this graph is more dense than the second one. And the second one is more sparse, okay? Uh, say on a particular day, some of the uh, nodes are deleted, means those nodes have high demand. So here, nodes uh, three, five, six, and eight are deleted because they have high demand. And then we also delete their associated edges. The remaining residual graph are the following. Okay, now in, in this graph, uh, how many trucks do you need? You need two trucks because the maximum number of matching is two, all right? So one truck for these two side, one truck for these two. For, for this example, you, you would need three trucks, one truck for these two sides, one for you know, those each, okay? So hopefully uh, uh, this demonstrate uh, the, the, the problem. So, so this is a two stage problem. Stage one, we design a graph design. Say, do we want a spot more sparse graph or more dense graph. So this is a tactical uh, decision. So which may remain for the rest quarter. And the second stage will be more operational decisions. Like on, uh, uh, for each day you see the memory realization and how do you dispatch your charts? Uh, so the question is, um, uh, uh, is to how to balance the trade-off between transportation cost and network complexity. On what extreme? Say we only use direct shipping. Okay, so that we here, and this network has least complexity, right? Because there's simply no edges, right? So they're really easy to manage. The downside, the transportation cost is the highest one. On the other extreme, say you implement a full flexibility network, means you can pull any two sides, you know, and that gives you the highest complexity, right? But, but uh, with the least transportation cost. Another question is, uh, can we design a spot, uh, a sweet spot in the middle, somehow balance the two metrics? All right, so let me pause for, for a second to see if any question. There are no open questions at the moment. Okay, there's one. I think that the question is, uh, can you elaborate a little more in binary demands with a real life example? Oh, oh good, okay. Uh, so here, um, yes, uh, so that's an excellent question. And binary demand, um, so it certainly is um, some conditions we impose for checkability. Uh, but, uh, but later when we use real data to calibrate the true demand, we, we actually use in, you know, those empirical demand. So a uh, better demand only serve as a, a, a good purpose for us to analyze potentially good graph, right? Uh, but uh, so eventually when we do simulations, use real data, we actually consider more general demand, right? So uh, and this is an excellent question. <clears throat> All right, um, let me briefly talk about literature review. Um, the research methodology is uh, related to graph matching. So there are many, many studies in matching in random graphs, right? Um, so uh, a slide from the early papers that um, consider the deterministic graph and here the pioneer work by, by Erdish and running for random graphs. Um, so there's also some many works um, in terms of how to find a maximum matching in polynomial time, right? So given a graph, can you find a maximum matching in polynomial time? And in recent years, uh, there has been a string of research uh, in terms of how to find a sparse subgraph that uh, the performance is close to the original graph. Uh, so here's uh, so I think the 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 spirit is very similar. 
So for our problem, we also want to find a sparse network. And the, the performance is very close to the performance of the full, full network. And graph matching has tremendous application in kitted exchange, uh, which I will not go over. Uh, the other major uh, uh, stream of research is on flexible operations. Uh, starting from the seminar paper by Jordan and Graves and their study uh, flexibility in, many, in traditional manufacturing settings. And there are many, many uh, um, research in, in this domain. And also I want to emphasize uh, flexibility is uh, something you know, quite you know, general, can be applied to many other contexts. So, uh, so which I will not go further. Um, finally, middle mass transportation is an active research uh, topic in recent years. Uh, but in OROM, um, to the best of, of my knowledge, I, I have not seen many research in, in this forum. So which is uh, something people may be interested in. Okay, now theory. Uh, okay, now let me first show you a lower bound. Uh, remember, we want to find a graph that the performance is very close to that of the complete graph, okay? Um, now, I want to show you a lower bound. So it means for any density of a graph, okay, say you fix a density of a graph, and then you try to find all graphs, you know, uh, with this density. So that in this graph, you know, so which means for any, any points in excess, Right. So say I, I fix the number of edges, means I fix the density of the graph. How can I design a graph that achieves the, the least cost? So, 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 so this theorem tells you a lower bound, okay? So essentially tells you that there's no way you can do better than this uh, curve, okay? So all the graph design must be for be, uh, you know, above this graph. So there's no, so for example, no way you can design a graph that falls below this graph, okay? So, that, so, so this tells you the lower bound, okay? Um, means for any graph with n sides and average no degree d. So we know the difference between these two measures is at least this number. So this number is something like this in the graph, okay? So uh, now the question is that can we design a graph that uh, is uh, uh, just very, uh, quite close to this lower bound, okay? So this is a purpose. We want to design a graph that is close to this lower bound. Okay, so the idea of designing a sparse graph, um, let me uh, revisit the key idea in the seminar paper by Jordan and Graves. So in the traditional manufacturing context, say you have many plants, you have several plants and several products, in a dedicated design, um, that, that, that is, uh, each plant only produce one product. In the other extreme, uh, say any plant can produce all the product. Now the question is that, can you design something in the middle? The answer is yes. So this is what we call the long chain design. Long chain means uh, one plant produce exactly two products. Right. So this guy pr pr produce, you know, this and this, and this pr uh, plant produce this and this, so on and so forth. So so uh, compared with uh, full flexibility, now you see this graph is much sparse. So it's more much more sparse than the full flexibility. But very surprisingly, the the performance of this long chain is very close to the full flexibility. Okay. So that's uh, the highlight. Yes, question. Quick question. So in the in case of long chain, when you mean, so these are all different plants, I assume, right? And you're looking at flexibility in terms of the number of products they're manufacturing within a plant. So here, what the, uh, the length of the chain really signify? So what, what, what is the long uh, context here? Is it? Oh, okay. So you mean, why do we call it long chain? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, so I suppose, okay, good. So my suspicion, my, my suspicion is that, uh, say you do greedy matching, right? So you do greedy allocation and then you, you actually have, have, uh, have this, right? So you can actually use this long chain to do greedy allocation. Once demand are realized, 
how do you design, uh, how do you do the optimal uh, allocation? Say you have capacity for each plant, demand are realized, then how do you do the optimal allocation? So, uh, so, so that is a simple greedy allocation. But here it's products, just... here products are distinct products, right? They're distinct products. All are all the six products or five products here are distinct products. Right, and... right, but th right. Uh, but you can use your capacity in this plant to mm -hmm. produce either this one or this one. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I suspect long chain means when you do this allocation, you you can actually do it greedy. So you just use a plant to produce here and then the remaining to fulfill and so on and so forth. So that will, will give you a relatively long chain. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay, now um, let me talk about all designs. So let me start with the two obvious one. One is the, you know, the direct shipping only. So there's no edges in the graph, right? So that that be one extreme. The other extreme is the full uh, flexibility that you have complete graph. You can pull any two sides together. Okay, now um, one uh, one intuitive idea is you can uh, divide the entire graph into several small graph faces, <clears throat> and then you you just pull uh, all these nodes together in each region. So uh, in this case, say we have eight uh, stations, right? And then we pull two stations together. Okay, so that will give you so-called K cluster. So K, K means the number of nodes in each cluster. So when K equals one, they are reduced to a uh, loud graph. When K equals two, they are reduced to you know, this graph. So it means each cluster has two nodes, so on and so forth. Okay, uh, so a more complete design is called K-ring. Somehow uh, the problem for this graph is that uh, the graph is disconnected. Now, um, can we add co uh, connectivity on top of K-cluster? Means we actually collect um, the label holding clusters together. So when K equals one, we build it on K-cluster K for K equals one, we simply add those nodes. Uh, clusters in the neighborhood, right? So we add this guy to here and to here. So that will give you a ring. So similarly, when k equals two, we simply collect any nodes in this cluster to any nodes in a neighborhood in cluster. So that gives you a more dense graph, so on and so forth. And finally, we also consider random designs. Okay, so random designs, for example, um, one to call this rain graph is that you randomly generate an edge with certain probability. So, say the, the probability is half, and then you randomly generate an edge with probability half independently. Um, another possibility is called random regular. So a regular graph means uh, that all, all the nodes have the same degree of edges. Uh, so a random regular graph is that you randomly generate a regular graph. So there are many, many such regular graphs. Uh, I want to emphasize that, uh, so the study here is only for theory purpose. So by no means, random graphs uh, are suitable in practice, right? So random graph means, so it's possible to link two sites that are further away. So clearly that's not feasible in practice. So, uh, so you know, they are more like serving um, as a benchmark to compare all designs. Okay, now let me show you an empirical evidence. So to, to roughly give you some idea, uh, so which de design may be good. Here we compare uh, three designs. One is the K cluster. So the, the yellow one, K cluster means uh, the one that is uh, disconnected. K ring means we add collectivity uh, two K clusters. So those are red dots. And finally, uh, uh, those rain are random graphs. Okay, now say we fix a density, right? we fix density, and then we see which design gives you the least uh, transportation cost. Okay, so based on this graph, so it looks that the red one is very promising. So the uh, red, red dots, so means the K ring, 
this one has connectivity, seems much better than K cluster. Okay, so this is also intuitive. Uh, so uh, once you add uh, connectivity to the graph, sometimes you can boost the, the, the performance. So that's why K ring is better than K cluster. Okay, now the theory part. Uh, so the summary of all theoretical results. Um, we mentioned earlier that we have a lower bound. Okay, so lower bound, um, uh, so it's the following. So D means the density, okay? Now, the idea is that can we design a graph to match this lower bound? So, um, so the answer is no for K cluster. So, uh, so as you see the rate of conversion here, so the lower bound is exponential in D, but, but the K cluster is only polynomial in D, so which means the conversion is much slower than the lower bound. So somehow explain why K cluster is not good at design. <clears throat> and then for K-ring, uh, uh, which is consistent with the empirical evidence, so actually they have the same convergence, right? So that's also decay very fast in D, somehow matches the lower bound. Uh, so the only carrier is that um, the coefficients are slightly different. So even though they both decay exponentially, they have different you know, decay rates. And then finally, for the random uh, graph, so the Erdos Rain graph, uh, similar to K ring, uh, but uh, so in one extreme, the coefficient even can match the lower bound. Okay, so in summary, that uh, K ring matches the lower bound in terms of the rate, uh, just with a different uh, coefficient. For 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 Erdos Rain, that we can actually match both, um, you know, as one of the parameters converge to one. So that will be consistent with the numerical result. Okay, so the uh, uh, position in the literature. <clears throat> so here, oh yeah, question. A quick uh, thought here. So the clustering approach is used to uh, find out which kind of, or how the kind of pooling of the trucks be done. Is that the intent? Uh, so is, are you clustering the nodes? Like what is oh, the purpose of this? Uh... Okay, so the the clustering is clustering the loads. No, so that two yeah. uh, right. So say so these two stations are close to each other. I just cluster them into one cluster. Got you. Got you. It is based on right. a distance uh, between each. So you have the coordinates and using you have the clustering. Okay. Okay. That's right. That's okay. right. Yes. Yes. Uh, and this one is uh, quite uh, relevant and and simple in to to implement in practice. So this is the so, simplest graph we can think about. So for the clustering in this case, because you're looking at density, uh, will the DB scan or other approaches work well here because of density of the uh, nodes here, right? So based on that, you're, you're making oh, the clustering. Oh, no, uh, uh, so, uh, no uh, so density means the number of edges, not nodes. So nodes are fixed. Uh, so the density means the number of uh, edges, means how many edges we have in this graph. Right, and these, those who are closer, you're kind of making cluster around that, right? Because the length is the, or the uh, distance between two nodes is what is your uh, similarity measure. You want to cluster those ones, right? Right, right, yes. So here you yeah. have k is equal to two, but if you have k equal to four, then probably you will have the left one and the right one. That's right, yes, that I only have two clusters. Okay. So, so that depends how, uh, so that depends how much density you want in this network, mm -hmm. right? So you first, uh, I, I think you, you have designed D first, say here, <clears throat> you decide your D first, and then ba based on D, based on your density, and then you design a graph. Yeah. So that way, so that way it's only fair to, 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 to compare a different graphs with the same density. Sure, sure. Thank you, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, uh, uh, position in the literature. Um, we want to point out that um, most of the literature considering edge deletion. Okay, so here we consider no deletion, means edges are no longer uh, deleted independently. And here we focus on simple and easy to interpret graph designs, like K clusters or K rings. 
we, we also emphasize that when the graph is complete, then, then essentially all results are tight. And for more general graph, we can also have two, uh, two over three approximation, uh, so which I will not go over. Okay, now finally, the remaining of my talk will be focused on case study. Okay, so that will be most relevant part. Um, okay, so the background, um, we have data from, from, our, uh, uh, from our industry collaborators. Um, we have cheap level transportation records um, um, between December 2018 to July 2019. Cheap level means we know on, on, on those days, on each day, how many trucks you know, from, from warehouse to which last mile stations and, and the size of the truck and the number of package on the truck, so on and so forth. We consider one largest city in China. So we consider the, the urban area of one of the largest city in China. Um, in, in this city, there's a dedicated warehouse and also 77 last mile stations. How do we use the data? We use the data to understand the network. Okay, so means the locations of the warehouse, routes of the chips, so on and so forth. We also use the data to understand the cost structure. Um, so uh, because we have chip level data, we know the cost for each chip um, and the vehicle type. Um, so for example, um, uh, 4.2 meters versus 7.6 meters in length. Right? So uh, we have different types of uh, uh, tracks. And also we know the, the origin, destination, distance, so on and so forth. Finally, we use the data to calibrate the, the demand, means the number of parcels on each chip. Okay, so here's some summary of the chips. And here, um, so roughly 43% 40, of all data are direct shipping only. Okay, and Roughly fifty-two percent have one, you know, one 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 additional stop. So so uh, which means more than ninety-five percent of our chips has at the most one one stop. Okay, so which uh, is consistent with our model, because in our model we only allow one truck to visit two sites. So which is consistent with the data. Okay. Now the cost structure. Okay, now we we fit a model to calibrate the cost. Okay, so here, three sixty is the fixed cost, right? So no matter how many stops you visit, no matter what the size is the truck, you always pay three fifty uh, three sixty. And then depending on how many additional stops you visit, you pay additional thirty for one stop, right? Right. Um, and then depends on the size, you know, the length of the truck, you, you add a plus 60 or minus 40. So it depends on the length of the truck. And the residual is the random turn. So it's mean uh, minus 0 0.6, standard deviation 27. So the takeaway is that the transportation cost is mainly depends on the fixed cost. Okay, so all others are relatively minor compared with the fixed cost. So that's why in our model, we consider the level of charge is a good approximation for reality. Otherwise, if you have to consider the length of truck and, and the, uh, uh, the additional stuff that we make much harder. And so this, the, the data shows that, it, you know, we only focus on the lump of truck is actually a good approximation. Okay, now the letter work. Um, so this will be the locations of those sites. The, the red one is the location of the warehouse. The blue dots are sites in, in the urban area and the yellow ones are the ones in non-urban areas. And this graph gives you uh, the historical chips. Uh, so for example, if uh, uh, historically one truck visited two sites, then we just add edges between these two sides. And then the density of the edge depends on how frequent you know, these two sides were pulled together. Okay, so based on here you can see, um, you know, that's actually not a good pattern. So it's quite somehow quite, quite, quite a random design. 
Okay, so service so means there's much room for improvement. Okay, now all graph design examples. So here for one ring, ring, uh, ring means we have collectivity in the graph. <clears throat> so one ring simply means this large Hamiltonian uh, cycle. And two ring is a, uh, based on one ring, we add a few more additional edges. Cluster means we divide this graph into multiple clusters and each cluster ha has four nodes. And this one is a completely random graph, okay? And then you, you can immediately see the downside of this graph means, you know, you actually pull two sides are further away. So which is clearly not feasible in, in practice. So that's why the random graph only serves as a benchmark, you know, to compare all, all designs. Okay, now uh, uh, result for binary demand. Okay, say so we, we fit a binary demand model. So, so that's what we have, will be the summary of results. And this in linear scale, this in log scale. So log scale may be more easier to, to see. Okay, so the lower the better. The, the, the green line means the lower bound. Okay, so lower bound, you know, there's no one can beat lower bound, <laughs> but we want to be uh, close to this lower bound. And um, then you can see the, the cluster design is clearly suboptimal. So, so the cluster design uh, just uh, consistent with our early results, um, 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 which is clearly suboptimal. And furthermore, the the ring design, so the one with collectivity, is very close to the random graph. Okay, and the blue one is the best, so it means the random regular. Um, okay, uh, but we don't have the theoretical performance for random regular. Uh, but it turns out that that's dominate the others. Okay, so a, a similar graph for, for empirical demand. Now in, in this test, we don't restrict to binary demand anymore. We just fit an empirical demand distribution. So this gives you this design. So a quite similar takeaways. For cluster, that's clearly suboptimal. For the other three, they are quite close to each other. Okay, so uh, conclusion is that um, um, K ring is better than K cluster and K ring is close to the other two random graphs. So that'll be the main takeaway from this simulation. Finally, we, we did a contextual analysis to see what, how much cost the company could have saved if they implement all the nice. Here, we consider two types of metrics. One is related to cost, right? The transportation cost means how many trucks uh, require. The other is the number of edges in the graph. So it's how then, so it's the network complexity of the graph. Okay, now we, we start from the cost side. Uh, compared with the state of the core, one ring, so the ring, uh, so the Hamiltonian cycle can reduce number of vehicles by 30%. So, so, so V means the number, the average number vehicles per day can be reduced from 77 to 54. Row means the truck utilization, means how much space, uh, how much capacity the truck are utilized. So which uh, can be improved from, from 47 to 67. Finally, the transportation cost can be reduced by 30%. Okay, now the other metrics. Oh, um, by the way, so, uh, so if we want to do better, right? So we design a more dense graph, two ring, and we can further reduce cost, but, but the difference somehow is more marginal. So means uh, if you do one ring, they'll be giving you significant benefits, but from one ring to two ring, the benefit becomes more marginal. Finally, uh, related to the network complexity, we see how many routes in the graph, okay? And we see that um, compared with the statistical code, so that's the graph I showed you earlier. So, uh, so this one, okay, so there's how many edges used in this graph. Um, so which is more than 300. And then if you, we use the one ring, so it's a more organized, optimized design, and then we can reduce that to 150. And then if you want to design from one ring to two ring, and the number of edges would increase from 154 to more than 200. 
so the main takeaway from the case study is that um, one way is good enough, uh, which can reduce more than 30% of the transportation cost. And then if you want, want to do further from one ring to two ring, well, you can still reduce transportation costs, but the cost uh, re reduction would be more marginal. And, and finally, the level of complexity will, will be increased. So for this city, one ring or two ring are, are good enough. All right, so finally, the main takeaway message is that a little flexibility is all you need. Right? So you don't need a full flexibility network. And somehow if you optimize your network, you use one ring, then you can reduce the transportation cost significantly. Okay, so that's all I want to share with you today. And um, thanks so much again for the invitation. Uh, I'm very ha happy to answer any question. Thank you, Dr. Linwe. Let's see if there are other questions. Uh, but but I think it was a fascinating example of how uh, you leverage graph theory and also data analytics, right? Particularly clustering techniques uh, to reduce transportation costs. So I think that is one of the bigger take uh, takeaway as well. Is given the data, how we can we leverage some theoretical concepts like clustering and other things to uh, cut down costs? So is it some part already implemented uh, already at Alibaba? Or? Uh uh, not yet. So, uh, so uh, this research was mainly with the research team. Uh, so, you know, they were convinced, but they have to further convince the business team to do some change. Um, and also, the change would be mostly uh, likely happen first on the local level. So, they don't want to train. You know, they, they don't want to train the entire network from A to B, right? They want to change it more locally and gradually. And this so, will have a lot of implications on the fleet providers uh, and, and their existing business with the transportation owners and all, right? So this is a very long uh, kind of change. Uh, might also influence their contract structures, other things as well, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And also, uh, uh, so one of my calls, uh, Yifan, who, who has been talking with uh, another business unit. So that's the unit doing a uh, courier. Uh, like so for for this work we only focus on like uh, e-commerce orders but there are many other you know couriers like uh, the regular express documents so um so the idea is very similar they want to maintain routine charts you know from a to b but they also want to add certain flexibility i think um so it's possible to extend the similar idea to that domain so that will gives you much higher impact than folks on, only on only on e-commerce orders. Right, right. But you also tell us this is mostly more also a strategic decision because you make this contract probably for a year. So you, have to, right. analyze, you have to analyze much a priority for the whole year and decide the kind of contracts over the edges, right? So this is slightly longer term decisions as well. So. That's right, that's right. So the graph design, um, so I was told that uh, the graph design may be you know, reconsidered every quarter. Uh, so it's the okay. design. Yeah, yeah. So it's slightly more tactical. That's what you're saying. Okay. More technical. Yes. 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 Great. Uh, good. Any other questions from the audience? Anybody? Any thoughts? Questions? Reflections? We can. So is this some spillover with JD.com? Your earlier work also, or? Uh, any uh, kind of spillover of this learning to the JD.com project that you did earlier? Is that any any kind oh, of okay. uh, So you're asking what whether the same idea can be applied to JD? Yeah, JD's network as well. Probably. Uh, I would think the the methodology is quite general. So yes. we yeah. yeah we don't actually use any specific uh, like feature of uh, Alibaba. So it's quite okay. general. I, I that helps. That helps quite a bit. Yeah. Great. Okay, uh, if there are no other questions, I think uh, it was a fascinating presentation in ways we really thoroughly excited uh, to host you. And uh, it was a great learning because as a part of our CTL center, which is Center for Transportation Logistics, uh, we are looking at uh, e-commerce as one of the uh, Thrive area because e-commerce order fulfillment is also a challenge in, in India. And uh, of course, our nuances are very different, especially in the volatility or the uncertainty in the finding the location and also returns are extremely high because you also have the cash on delivery which is the bigger uh, proportion of our orders 
So we are looking at a lot of, a lot of interesting problems around the delivery side uh, that is of huge importance to us, but middle while is something we often ignore. And I think that is something you uh, brought out as well. So I think it's, it's quite a bit of learning in the e-commerce domain. It'll be interesting to also see how this work fits in terms of sustainability. So if the edges become longer, uh, what is the implications of that? Yeah, you might save some cost on the transport side, but what are the implications on the emissions of the other uh, part of it as well? So that trade-off may be interesting. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. No, we are, it, is, it is a fascinating talk. Thank you again. Uh, and thank you, audience or participants, for joining this uh, talk. And uh, we hope to host you in person sometime, Linway, if you visit us. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you. Yeah, thank I, you. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much again. Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, bye bye. Have, have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye bye.